I have another crazy mother-in-law drama for you. This one's a saga. It comes complete with every single update. Guys, grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and relax. Another saga story is coming your way. So, my stepmother-in-law is usually a lovely woman. She's kind, helpful, and sweet. But lord, recently I want to strangle her. Background. Father-in-law married stepmother-in-law when dear husband was a teenager, so they've been together for quite a while. She has had infertility issues in the past, and after countless failed IVF tries, found out that they could not have children. I think one of the benefits of marrying father-in-law was that she would inherit two sons. Even if they were close to being legal adults, I guess she knew one day they would have children and she'd still be a grandmother. Now this brings me to my issue. Before I gave birth to dear daughter, I knew an influx of annoying stuff was coming my way because there hasn't been a girl born into the family for a long time. But I definitely did not think it would be this bad. When I was pregnant with dear daughter, my stepmother-in-law bought me four bin bags worth of clothes. Despite my specific request for no one to buy me clothes because A, she'll outgrow them in a matter of weeks, it's a waste of money. B, my in-laws have a tendency to buy clothes that say crap like grandma's number one girl, daddy's girl, etc. When I told my stepmother-in-law that I learned my mistake last time around and I won't even have people wait in the delivery room because of the crap storm that was the birth of my first child, a, a whole other story of stepmother-in-law versus mother-in-law who can outcry each other. She knows I have clear boundaries and has seen the repercussions when people overstep them with my mother-in-law. So instead of complaining to me, she said, Oh, okay, I understand. But I was told by father-in-law later on that she cried herself to sleep every night for a week. I have a good relationship with my stepmother-in-law, so this did hurt me to hear that. But at the same time, it felt like a guilt trip. I sat her down and told her this wasn't about her and of course she'll be involved in the daughter's life. Just hold off for a bit. She seemed to understand, but she clearly did not because the past year has been difficult to say the least. This leads me up to today. I'll bullet points just so it's a little organized. She constantly refers to my daughter as variations of her precious little girl. I walked in on her hovering over dear daughter in her crib, saying, You're the child I've prayed for, my little girl. God's truly answered my prayers. Tried to give my daughter a middle name because, well, I got to give dear daughter her first name. Um, that's not how it works. Probably one of the weirdest things, though, is when she said, She's so beautiful. She got that from you. It's a shame. I always wanted to see my features on my child. Maybe we can say she has my eyes. I actually just looked at her like WTF, lady. When my daughter cries, this woman turns into Usain Bolt and goes to pick her up saying, Shh, I'm here now. You're okay. Nothing can hurt you. What was going to hurt her, stepmother-in-law? <laughs> There's nothing in here. And finally, the guilt trips. Now, I'm very reluctant on my child sleeping over at people's houses, because they're still very young. But despite this, she still constantly asks, can I have dear daughter over for the night? Giving reasons like, what about next week? Now, she makes statements, example, I've set up the whole nursery and she hasn't even used it once and then creepily stares at me. So guys, I just need some advice. I don't know how to handle this. Sometimes I'd rather, I don't know, she just be like my mother-in-law, just an upfront jerk because I can deal with that. I just don't know how to deal with passive aggressiveness. Technically, she doesn't overstep my boundaries, but she'll find loopholes or guilt trip me all the time. I get it. You did not get to have children. Honestly, I feel for you. But that doesn't mean my daughter's going to be the baby you've always wanted to have. However, she has been there for me and, and honestly, a sweet person overall. But ever since I've had my daughter, she has become overbearing. Dear husband loves his dad and my stepmother-in-law. 
and his dad can't bear his wife being upset. So, I know if dear husband and I try to talk to her formally about it, she'll just cry and guilt trip me. I don't know how to handle weepy people. Any advice, guys? What's up, guys? Mr. Redito here. There is multiple updates for this crazy stepmother-in-law drama. I'm telling you, I have every single update, so sit back, grab your favorite ice-cold beverage, and here is update number one. So, I was going to wait till Friday when stepmother-in-law, father-in-law, brother-in-law, his wife and kids come over. My naive self thinking this was a quote, take her to the side for a five-minute chat situation. <laughs> but you guys scared the duck out of me with your comment, so I had to get my ducks in a row immediately. Now, I have to say the stories here, some of which you've brought me to my attention. Also, shout out to the person who linked the trailer to The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, the singular most terrifying movie clip I've ever seen as a mother. It's so out of my spectrum and everything. I know it was hard to adjust, let alone coming to the realization this could be my situation. Okay, I'll give you a rundown of last night's events. As soon as I saw my dear husband in the evening, I burst out crying. He just looked at me shocked because I rarely ever cry, so even if he did not think the stepmother-in-law situation was bad before, he knew it must be making me feel this way. I began by telling him everything. <laughs> I mean everything. He would notice I would occasionally tell him when I was at the brink of ripping my hair out because of the stuff stepmother-in-law would do, but never in full details. Mainly because when I see my dear husband, I want to have a real conversation with him. It was like word vomit. I told him about the pet names, the constant holding, the running to get her before me, the clothes, all the stuff through my pregnancy, the nursery, the constant whispering in dear daughter's ear of God knows what. The photo album. She takes pictures constantly and has already filled out a massive album. She has more photos than me. The sad statements, the looks, duck, I forgot to mention the looks. When I'm holding my daughter, she would just give me the weirdest look ever. It's like a combination of sadness, creepy, anger, and confusion. So, I finished reading him just a few of your comments. I highlighted what a lot of you guys said, that stepmother-in-law did not properly address or handle her grief, and it's manifested into an obsession with my daughter. Her unhealthy attachment to dear daughter is not only damaging to the daughter and the son, who will grow up noticing the different attention they get by her. Everyone else treats them the same except for stepmother-in-law, but her own mental health also. I made it clear I do genuinely have love for her, but I'm scared with this unhealthy attachment and it's more serious than we both previously thought. I need both of us to talk to stepmother-in-law and father-in-law because I'm scared about how this could end. He just sat there and listened to everything I said and read. The first thing he did was hug me. And for someone who doesn't cry, Lord, I think I cried for England in that moment. He began saying he always knew she had not processed her grief properly and told me a few of the instances when he was a teenager. He said first things first... My dad has to realize that his wife is primary concern, and she needs help, and dear husband's primary concern is me and the kids, and his dad needs to respect that. He said that we should talk to them together, because his dad will most likely try to shut it down if he just bikes to his dad separately. We had a whole plan to start off from the point of concern rather than attack slowly, branching into our issues, outlining our rules and boundaries, clearly and firmly. That were not to be overridden, manipulated, influenced, or stomped over. Any breach of our boundaries would indicate that stepmother-in-law does not respect our role, as dear daughter, dear son's parents, and as individuals. And with all the violations, there's repercussions. Then coming back to concern, addressing her mental health. Her processing her grief. By the way, best friend who is like a sister to me and is in a loop because we're very close. Went through her own miscarriage a few years ago. Went to therapy and gave me the contact info of her therapist. 
we would definitely just be there for her emotionally as well. I made it clear to my dear husband that even if she agrees to respect our boundaries and acknowledge all the indirect ways she doesn't abide by them, I still want her to go to therapy because those issues won't go away. And if she can't inflict them on dear daughter, she will only internalize them and in turn cause herself more inner conflict and I'm genuinely concerned about her mental health. Dear husband agreed and said we'll outline that to be a necessity. We had notes. We were on the same page. The kids were sleeping. I had calmed down. Great. Then, I get a text from mother-in-law saying, Can she and father-in-law come around tomorrow for dinner instead because Friday they have a meeting for some event thing at their church? Great. My anxiety-ridden mind can face this quicker and won't have to be drawn out until the end of the week. Everything was set. I had dear husband's full support and he'd be addressing everything with me. My stepmother-in-law is a rational woman. What could go wrong? Well, the shitstorm that was today shouts back everything. Update number two. I just want to start off by saying this happened a few hours ago, so I'm still pretty much overwhelmed. I know you guys are used to this craziness of mother-in-laws, but this level's still very much new to me, so I'm still in a bit of shock. Please forgive me for any mistakes or errors in grammar. As I was getting ready in the morning, my hands were a little shaky and it felt like something left a knife in my stomach. I think this was my body just warning me something was about to go down. The whole day at work, the day dragged on. Blah, blah, blah. But let's get to the juicy point. Stepmother-in-law and father-in-law live a 30-minute drive away and they're always on time. I picked up the kids and settled them down. Dear husband comes home and I start to prep dinner. Everything was set. We were planning to have the talk after dinner when the kids went down just to make life easier. The door rings. Dear husband gets it. They come in. Greet everyone. Stepmother-in-law spots dear daughter in my arms and makes beeline towards me and puts her arms out. My darling, you're getting so big. Come to Nana. I just looked at her and said, actually, can you help me in the kitchen and handed my kid to dear husband? She looked a little taken back, but she still came along and helped me out. It was dinner time. We were eating. She spends the dinner fussing and cooing and generally devoting her time to dear daughter, who's just making a mess. So I say, Stepmother-in-law, your food's getting cold. Oh, it's fine. Baby voices me. Princess is being a little fussy. She needs some attention, don't you? She could care less about you right now. Um, she's just enjoying her food. You should too. Nonsense. Well, shortly after, the kids get put to bed despite protests from stepmother-in-law. I came down to her talking to dear husband and father-in-law saying, Panther, seems very short today, is she okay? I walk up and answer before dear husband, Actually, stepmother-in-law, we've been meaning to speak to you. All color from her face disappeared. It was the creepiest thing I've ever seen. I was a bit taken back, but I continued. I sat next to dear husband, so we were sat across from stepmother-in-law and father-in-law. This is what happened. Well, I hope you don't take this as an attack as we greatly concerned about the situation. Since dear daughter has come along, we've noticed you changed from the warm and loving grandmother to dear son to adopting a direct mother role with dear daughter. We just want to make it clear so there's no confusion. We are daughter's parents. And that's that. Stepmother-in-law is weeping at this point and commences right on cue. Me, I hand her over some tissues and say, Oh, I'll continue. We have a clear set of boundaries that you have continually crossed. Most likely unintentionally, but crossed nevertheless. So we want to redefine them so there's no confusion. Number one. I am dear daughter's mother. When she cries and I'm two feet away from her, I don't appreciate you rushing past me to pick her up. Sometimes let her cry it out. Don't go pick her up. Number two. Dear daughter isn't yours. Father-in-law looks annoyed as I continue. 
Please stop referring to her as your little girl, your princess, or anything related to that. You're her grandmother, a wonderful one, but please understand your role. Number three, the constant photographs. I mean, you're not a paparazzi. You can enjoy a moment with dear daughter without having to snap a photograph just to appreciate the moment. Please stop harassing me for FaceTime sessions when you've just seen her. And finally, number four, stepmother-in-law's getting visibly more upset and dear husband says, uh, I can see you're getting upset, and Dad, I know this is an issue for you, but you have to realize our primary concern is our children, and we're worried about stepmother-in-law. She's developed an unhealthy attachment to dear daughter, and she needs to address the underlying issue. Her grief. We know this is hard for you, but until you handle that, we don't feel comfortable with you being alone with dear daughter. Ah, uh, this is what did it. She was weepy before... Father-in-law was annoyed, but holy shit, this led to the explosion. She jumped up, shouted, You can't take her away from me, she's all I have. I love that little girl. I would never do anything that would cause her harm. Why are you trying to keep me away from her? Panther, I've done so much for you. I was the mother-in-law that dear husband's bio mother wasn't. And this is how you choose to repay me? By taking away my little girl. I don't have issues. I couldn't have children on God himself blessed me with a family of my own. And now you're trying to take her away from me. Ah, she runs out of the room shouting dear daughter's name. We all just sat there stunned. Never in my life did I think she was even capable of screeching that loud. And I don't think father-in-law did either. I shot up and followed her and ran past her blocking her entry to the stairs. I was shouting for dear husband. She was weeping. Holy Lord knows why it was taking them so long. I just pushed stepmother-in-law back and said, You need to leave. Get the duck out of my house. You're going to wake up my kids with your wailing. My voice was so firm and oddly unfazed, even though I was in complete shock. She looked at me and collapsed, grabbing onto my feet, begging and groveling at the floor, and still wailing. It was hard to understand her. Dear husband and father-in-law appear and were just as shocked as I was, but they had it written all over their face. Dear husband walks over to us and unclaws her hand from my feet, lifts up her limp body. She grabs dear husband by his face and weeps, Please, I'll do whatever you want. I'll listen to your rules. Please don't take her away from me. She's my little girl. Dear husband looked at father-in-law and said, She needs help more than what any one of us can give her. Father-in-law finally snaps out of his trance and takes stepmother-in-law's hand and is trying to calm her down and put her jacket on. She's still weeping as they open the door. Please, please, Panther, please. Oh, that's the last thing I hear before they get in the car and drive off. I run up to check on the children. They're both fast asleep somehow. I walk back downstairs and just sit on the stair set. Then dear husband walks over and sits down next to me, holds my hand, and we sat there in silence for the next five minutes, mentally processing what happened. I called my child sitter to let her know that she can't release the kids to anyone but me or dear husband. Because in the past, father-in-law and stepmother-in-law have picked up the kids for me before she's familiar with them. We already have a security system, cameras, and passcodes that only me and dear husband know about. I also emailed my boss, which happens to be my friend, to let her know I won't be in tomorrow. I doubt I'm going to get much sleep tonight. I'm pretty lost and stunned after all this. Well, guys, I'm here for you with update number three, and man, if you've stuck through it this long, well, things are about to be a shit show. A lot's happened. I wanted to write it up whilst it was still fresh, but it kept tumbling into a massive storm, so I've skipped all on details. You've all been so supported and provided me with great advice and have checked up on me, so I want to thank you all. Well... Here's the crap show. Everything was quiet for a few days. We had not heard from stepmother-in-law or father-in-law directly, but brother-in-law said his dad, which is father-in-law, 
was taking care of the situation, which I assumed that meant father-in-law was taking her to see a professional. Dear husband texted his dad that we're glad that he was taking the much-needed steps to get her professional attention, and there's no shame behind that. We're concerned for her well-being, but due to recent events, we'll be limiting our contact, and there's to be no contact with the children until we see great improvement, though visits will still be supervised. We hope she's getting the help she needs, and we wish them luck. He replied, I understand. Thank you. Cool. I took time off work because I was a little anxious, and we were in the process of hiring a nanny. Not new already, it was pre-planned, but apart from the whirlwind that was the breakdown, I thought the situation was contained. This is where the narrator in my life says, Oh, she thought wrong. I didn't want to leave the house for Mother's Day, but dear husband planned a whole day, so we agreed we'll celebrate it. I don't know why, but I just felt a little guilty. In the back of my mind, I couldn't help but think stepmother-in-law, who we celebrate every year, and she was probably a mess. So, the morning of, I laid out my makeup and went to have a shower. I came back and several products are gone. I assumed it was stress and that I must have forgotten to put it up or just misplaced it. So, after looking for a while and having not found them, I just used a different product and my spare brushes. It was odd, but not unlike me to misplace things, so whatever. We leave. Dear husband, the kids, and I are all having brunch at a restaurant, 15 minutes from the house. It was fairly packed. It was a little colder than I expected, so I thought I'd grab a jacket for my kids, and by the time I got back, the food would have arrived. So, off I go. Now, when I pull up, I notice the door. Side door where the recycling bin, outdoor bin, etc. are, but... There's a window opening above that. It was slightly open. It's not a door that has a lock, so I assume the wind must have just opened it slightly, but it was still odd. I went to close the door, and I noticed a trash can falling over. Now, this was definitely odd. The wind could not have knocked this over. It was full. Now, I was a little on edge, but I remained calmed and cautious. I went to the front of the house, slowly unlocked the door with my keys and closed the door behind me. My heart was racing. I was sure I was overreacting, but I had a dreadful feeling. I walked up the stairs, walked past my son's room, walked up to my daughter's room, and the sight I saw horrified me. My daughter's clothes were organized in rows on the floor, not folded but laid out, outfits completely with shoes and accessories. There, sitting cross-legged on the floor, was stepmother-in-law. All I could say was, what the duck? This lady got up so fast and sighed like she's been waiting on me. Oh, thank God you're here, Panther. I came to celebrate Mother's Day with the babies. No one was here. I couldn't decide on what outfit to put her in, so I laid them all out to get a visual. I literally thought I was the one going crazy. I took out my phone to call dear husband and she grabbed my phone and said, No, 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 we don't have to do that. With a freaking creepiest grin, now I was split. My heart was saying, duck this crap, start swinging. But my head was saying, she's unwell, vulnerable, and clearly unstable. So, our conversation went something like this. <sighs> you need to leave right now, you're not supposed to be here, we're no contact. But it's Mother's Day. It's the day God meant for mothers and children. I should be with my baby. Well, at this point, I was done. She's not your daughter. I'm her mother. She's my daughter. You're not even bio-related to her. I'm done with this shit. Snatches the phone back. I started to walk down the stairs to call dear husband from downstairs, and this woman sobbing behind me. I was so done. You could say this chick ran out of her patience. I call dear husband and tell him. He wanted to drive back, but I did not want him to bring the kids back to this mess. So I said drop them off his sister-in-law's house, then come immediately. This woman was screaming over my shoulder. Panther, is that dear husband? Is he bringing dear daughter? Oh my gosh, I knew you'd come around. See, this was a misunderstanding. Babies are supposed to be with their mothers. <laughs> 
Oh my god. Hey, you're delusional. I can never let you be around them. You broke into my house. Who even does that? I'm calling the police. Oh, you can't. We're family. I'm not doing anything wrong. You're trying to keep her from me. Oh, half of me wanted to beat some scent into her, but the other half was so freaked out and thought it would be better for the police to handle this shit. The phone was ringing as I said hello and turned back around. This woman has two kitchen knives, each one pointing at her temple. I never felt more powerless and horrified. She was sobbing that she can't live in this world without her baby. I try to speak calmly and slowly, not to scare her, but I don't know, I'm about to faint. She's screaming and sobbing uncontrollably, saying she can't live in this world anymore. It's too painful, too evil. Oh, now I'm crying. Half because I'm terrified, the other half what she's saying is just horrible. I'm begging, pleading with her, but... I know the only thing that'll get her to put down the knives is my daughter. I tell her she can't do this. How will it affect dear daughter? Without her grandmother here, she needs you. She starts to whimper and drops the knife. I pick them up just as the police arrive. The rest of the day was a bit of a blur. I remember dear husband, father-in-law, brother-in-law arriving shortly after. I remember screaming at father-in-law that he was weak and cowardly and that he needs to put her into a hospital where she needs to be psychologically analyzed. I felt bad at how I was just screaming at him, but that was one of the most terrifying moments I've ever witnessed. Stepmother-in-law went into a psychiatric hold and she's still in the hospital right now. Neither myself or dear husband have gone to see her, but sister-in-law told me the first day... She was screaming out, just let me die, and crying for dear daughter. It's been a week, but I was told she's made some improvement. I don't know how to feel. On one hand, I feel our relationship's permanently damaged. I feel guilty because I know she's unwell, but a part of me will always feel she's unpredictable, and therefore unsafe to be around. By the way, I'm British, guys, but I live in the U.S. I met dear husband in college, got married, and stayed. So, I don't have any of my own family to lean on here, but we have an apartment in another state where my best friend happens to live a 10-minute drive away. So, me and the kids are going to be there for a few weeks. We're also looking to move, and this whole thing has been a trial, <laughs> to say the least. Hopefully, this is the end of the madness. Well, guys, Mr. Redito here, and that's not the end of the madness, part 4. Hey guys, I'll give you a rundown of what's been going on. Stepmother-in-law is out of the hospital from what I've heard from, sister-in-law. Her delusions have stopped, but she's very depressed at the reality of her life and what's happened. She's now attending therapy. The restraining order, it was granted. We spoke to our lawyers and the breaking entering charges was a lot trickier than we thought. And honestly, we think she needs mental help more than criminal correction, so we decided against it. We have a complete new security system that covers the whole grounds. New locks, new passwords, it all. This all got changed on that day. The house, well, it got put up for sale. I'm sad about this because it's my dream house, but too much has happened. It's just ruined it for us. Plus, stepmother-in-law and father-in-law live a 20-minute drive away. It's just way too close. Me and the kids are temporarily staying in our apartment in another state. Stepmother-in-law has never been here, neither does she even know the address. My friends have been super supportive, and my sister even flown over. She's been great. Still, I gave pictures of the doorman for what she looks like just in case. We finalized our will, and we've already been doing this to ensure father-in-law and stepmother-in-law will never be the guardians of our children. I just wanted to clear some things up in my last post. I don't feel sorry for her, as in, oh, I'll forgive her, poor her. She's not a threat. Sorry more. More like, this is an unfortunate situation and it's a shame. It had to end in no contact. Don't get me wrong. I felt sad at first, but not enough to place her needs above mine and my children's. If I'm being completely honest, even with the RO, I think she'll still come for us. I doubt she cares about legal repercussions, Sister-in-law said it took some time, but she did not have or seem delusional anymore, just depressed, and that she cries all day, and she won't see us for a long time because of what she did. 
I just can't take the risk of her being around my children and knowing what she's capable of. But they will no doubt try to guilt us into seeing them, especially with birthdays coming up. Well, hell will freeze over before that happens. Father-in-law promised stepmother-in-law that when she gets better, that of course she'll get to see us. Brother-in-law stepped in and said that's not his decision and we've made it clear that stepmother-in-law won't be around our children for a long time. Well, that made her cry. The flying monkeys have hit us with full force. People from stepmother-in-law's church called Dear Husband. They were rambling on about how this situation is terrible and how we should not abandon her in the time of need. He hung up. The pastor of the church met with Dear Husband and he was lovely. He said we were taking the right steps to ensure the safety of our children. We have a vacation plan already booked, so we'll be out of the country for a few months. Unfortunately, we can't move out of the U.S. permanently. It's just not the right time for us. But we're definitely moving states. A fresh start's overdue. To top it off, my mother-in-law has returned from her travels and Timbuktu harassing dear husband for details and sweeping in, trying to adopt the stable parental and grandparent role. Great. Also, I never found the missing makeup. I had to repurchase the product, which sucks because it's super expensive. Hey guys, that's basically the end of the saga. I just want to add this little update that came out a few months after all this went down. Hey guys, I have an update about my stepmother-in-law who thinks my daughter is the child she'll never get to have. As some of you know the saga and just listen to it, it's way overdue. So some of you remember during Niobe's mental breakdown, she broke into my house and mysteriously my makeup disappeared too, but no one ever spoke about it again. Well, a few weeks ago, I was in Old State and Hometown to finalize a few things and attend my good friend's engagement party. Now, Niobe, my stepmother-in-law, was good friends with said friend's mother. But after this all kicked off, my friend saw what a mess I was. And her mother was the one who told me Niobe was telling people I had an affair. And what she claimed was the reason I was moving. Well, friend's mother was disgusted at her lies and cut her off. Niobe, however, still felt the need to congratulate my friend on her engagement and give her a basket of gifts. So, I asked friend what she got. She went upstairs, grabbed the basket, and you guys, everything in that basket was a brand new version of everything I had owned that Niobe stole. The exact foundation that went missing, the bronzer, the lipstick, all my shades, which is crazy because my friend's pale. A lingerie set, hair ties, perfume, you name it. To say we were creeped out is an understatement. I don't know if she did it to duck with me or what, but I'd say pretty damning evidence. You know what's funny? That is the least crazy these past two months have been. Thank you so much for listening to this crazy stepmother-in-law saga. All right, guys, so that stepmother-in-law is absolutely bonkers. I wish that she would have got mental help a lot sooner, and it just seems like father-in-law did a poor job of trying to get her the help she needed. Let me know what you would do if you were in this unique situation. Guys, I had... A suspicion all along that the mother-in-law was the thief behind the makeup and it turns out I was right. Let's read this comment. Not gonna lie guys, I thought stepmother-in-law wanted to steal the baby and using the mom's makeup would make step's mother-in-law smell more like the mom and make the transition easier for the baby. Well, clearly I read too much into that. Turns out stepmother-in-law's just a weirdo who likes to steal everything and put it in gift baskets. So guys, let me know. Drop your comments down below if you've ever had a stepmother-in-law, mother-in-law, father-in-law, brother-in-law story that you think can rival one like this. Guys, I have a special one for you today. This story is about a mama's boy and how his girlfriend just can't cope with it anymore. This is the second time now. Getting cheated on has led to me being dumped. At least this time, it wasn't totally baffling. First time can be read about on my profile, but also to my followers waiting on the end results of Creepy Lunger. The court date set for July, and I'll update you after that, but this is not that story. So, 
I've been dating this guy for about four months now. He's not my usual type, and he's very naive and sheltered. Whereas my life has been a joyous ride of how in the name of flapjacks did I survive that BS. He's nice and funny. We met at university, and for the most part, it was fine. There were a few red flags, like his mom still irons and folds his undies and socks. But let's be real, people in their early 20s living at home is not even a shocking thing anymore. I just think it's a bit psychotic to iron socks, but hey, that's just me. Anyways, on Saturday, he went out for a lad's night with his friends. He hooks up with a girl. They have sex, and yesterday, she messaged me on Facebook to basically say, he, sorry, I was drunk and slept with your boyfriend. I had no idea he was in a relationship. I'm sorry. Well, I was fine with it, though. It was nice for her to reach out and let me know. She was really cool. We chatted for a bit and decided to go grab a Costa together on Thursday. I like talking to her, and, well, we have a lot in common. This is completely platonic. I mentioned in my last post, monogamy isn't really my thing. Unless we've had a discussion and agreed to be monogamous, I do not care. I don't tend to sleep with people in general. I have a low sex drive due to pure exhaustion and cancer. So, if you want it and I'm not up for it, go get it somewhere else. I don't care. Just use condoms and don't be with the same person multiple times because there's a difference between casual and multiple relationships. He gets home, and I casually mention she messaged me, and we've been talking, and reassure him. I don't mind that he slept with someone else. Just would prefer, in the future, he wears a condom and hopes she would not mind getting tested before we sleep together again. He was fine with all that, and was really surprised with how well I took it. But I had discussed my feelings on monogamy with him before we started dating, so it wasn't a massive shock. Like, it was to the last guy. Then I make an off-handed joke, saying, Hey, next time you decide to sleep with a hot girl, let me know, and if I'm up for it, maybe we can turn it into something else. Ugh. It was said jokingly, and I was 100% joking about the threesome, and then he said, Why would you want to sleep with another girl? Well, this is where the overall stupidity kicks in. I remind him I'm bisexual, and he says exactly what it says in the title, with a really confused face. Uh, you're still bi? Uh, I thought you outgrew that when you started dating. He follows up with, My mom said you would because bisexuality is just a phase. I face planted, like threw my hands to my forehead so hard my butt jiggled from the force of the slap. It was just ridiculously stupid for a 24-year-old male in 21st century Britain to be saying these kind of things. Like, dude, I know you're naive, but do you not watch TV? Do you not go on social media? What in the name of RuPaul do you think sexuality is at 24 to think bisexuality is a phase? I didn't know what to say. I stood looking at him like he just sprouted another head out of his armpit. And may I point out, this guy is doing a BSc in sociology, and of course I did for undergraduate, and know that sexuality and gender are two things very much covered in any sociology course. Well, I was floored. It took me a few minutes to regain my composure, and I realized I had two options. Laugh, laugh at the sheer ridiculousness of a 24-year-old male having not only discussed my sexuality with his mom, but had believed her when she told him I'd grow out of it. Or I could try to explain sexuality to an adult sociology student. I knew the status of my relationship was at stake with whatever decision I made. I contemplated hard and then I laughed. I laughed so hard my bladder nearly burst. Sorry, not the mature decision, but you know what? I don't care. It was freaking hilarious. He'd said it was such an honest, innocent mistake. Look, I can live with his mom ironing his socks. I can live with his mom still buying his clothes and taking him to get a haircut. Because honestly, I have my own shortcomings, and if he can tolerate those, I can tolerate his. But I will not live with someone being so clueless about sexuality. 
Maybe I'm the entitled one here, maybe I have too higher expectations of people, but I don't know. He of course got mad that I laughed at him and started shouting, and I kid you not, he managed to fit my mom says, my mom says that, and but my mom is, into one 45-ish second monologue seven times. I'll do a lot of things for love, but I won't compete with mummy. Frankly, I just didn't feel enough for him to even try. He grabbed his backpack, called his mom to come get him and left. That night after chatting with the girl he slept with and laughing some more that his mother sent me this text. I cannot believe you would humiliate my son like that, you selfish, stupid little witch. You're a fat, ugly girl who is using bisexuality as an excuse to do what you want to do. I know your type, and you've just thrown away the best thing you'll ever have with my son. My son deserves way better than a fat little girl like you. We'll be coming tomorrow to get the rest of his things from your house, and I'll be bringing my brother to deal with you if you try and pull anything. He knows how to deal with trash. If you try and steal anything, I'll call the police. He had better be there when I get there, or else. So yeah... Not only did his mother break up with him for me, though I pretty much expected the breakup, she also called me some lovely names. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there. I texted her back asking what time she'd be coming, ignoring everything else, and she did not respond. No way in Hades was I waiting around all day for this lunatic. Her brother and son turn up for his laptop, toothbrush, and some random bits of clothes. This brings me to the morning. I'd popped all his stuff into a bag and left it by the front door, except his laptop, which was on the table next to the front door, just because I did not want it to break. I do the school run for my sister every morning because she doesn't drive. Off we go at 8.20. We drop my gorgeous little nephew off at school at 8.50, get home for 9.30, having stopped at the shop on the way home, as my sister needed to pick up a few bits for the boyo. Guess who's there waiting outside my front door? If you'd guessed the tantruming trio, you'd be right. Da ding ding ding. If you guessed the police, <laughs> ding ding, you'd also be right. Most logical people would say, hmm, she's not home. Guess we'll have to wait and come back later. Entitled mom with serious emotional issues. She's not in. We should break into her house. I get there and this girl's handcuffed in the back of the police car. My double glazed stained glass window pane that has a rose decoration broken into sections by bits of metal looks. As though it's gone through three rounds with a rock. <laughs> because it had. And my ex's uncle shouting at the officer that I'm a thief and they were just coming to get what was my ex's. The officer reminds him even if they were trying to retrieve his property, breaking and entering is a crime. So, the police officer then approaches me and says, Good morning, miss. This gentleman says you've arranged for them to come collect his young man's possessions this morning. Is that true? I replied with, oh, No, ex's mom sent me this message last night. Show him the phone. And did not reply with time, but X knows I do the school run every day, so not sure why they chose now. The officer reads over my phone text, calls over his colleague, and they go over to the witch in handcuffs. They ask said witch, What do you mean when you told this girl your brother will deal with her? Witches started to babble, brother got very quiet, and X just looked lost. Also, brother's basically the same height as me, and I have more fat in one butt cheek than he does in his entire body. So, I could have definitely taken him. I'm just completely bemused at this point. The officers come back over and explain because she was caught in the act by police of attempting to break into my house. I do not have a choice about pressing charges and ask if I'd like to add harassment and making threats to that list. Well... I'm in the middle of a court case already due to that story I mentioned in the beginning with a certain lunger and really don't have the mental capacity right now so I decline. They take pictures of the damage, not that there was much. I'd give them X's stuff so he can leave and they go on their merry way. Once I clean the window, there's a tiny crack on the outside glass that did not affect the front pane. 
I'm now 15 stone lighter and getting a little flirty with the girls he slept with on Saturday. What I'm taking away from this relationship? If mommy irons his undies regardless of age, run. Run fast. Run fast and far. And preferably with a pretty brunette in the future. Hope you enjoyed and wish me luck for tomorrow for maybe not so platonic Costa with the girl he quote cheated on me with. What's up guys, Mr. Redito here. I'm excited to announce there's multiple updates for this story. And if you think that it's juicy now, just wait for the drama that's about to unfold. Guys, here's update number one, which came out two days after the original post. As those who read my first thread will remember, my delightful ex-boyfriend had, what I now know, to be pretty lousy sex with a lovely brunette on Saturday of last week. She messaged me on Tuesday, having found out through the Book of Faces that we're a couple and apologized for sleeping with my man. It wasn't an issue. I'm not really monogamous and she was hot. <laughs> I got why he went there. We got chatting and decided to meet up at Costa on Thursday and spent most of Tuesday and Wednesday chatting. She lived for the psycho mama drama that I got hit with when ex Bo's mommy broke up with me for him. After I laughed at him for thinking his adequately sized man stick would cure me of my bisexuality, Mother Dearest then attempted to break into my house in the dumbest way possible, and got herself some shiny new metal bracelets. Reason it was dumb, you might ask, well, first of all, something I had forgotten about. X knows the combination to my key safe, so he could have legitimately just let himself into my house, got his belongings from the front door and left. No harm, no foul. Second, the layout of my front door, well, there's a door with a lovely rose design with a metal crossing in it. Next to my front door is an ordinary glass window the same size as my door. This genius of a woman attacked my door window, not the window next to it. The delightful gentleman that came to assess my window said that had she attacked the window, not the door window, she'd have broken through easily. The door, though, has reinforced glass. Third, I only learnt about it this yesterday, mother of the year, took a bite out of the police officer, so bye bye mommy, see you in five to seven months. From what I was told during my date, mommy has earned a nice little ankle bracelet until court. I'm not sure of the exact details, but hey, not my circus. So, now we get to the nitty gritty. The date itself. Everything was fine, she looked beautiful. I looked, well, like me. I got the new Aero Caramel Hot Chocolate, she got a cappuccino. We sat down, my back to the door, and a few minutes in, she lets out this adorable little half-gasp, half-chortle. She's staring behind me, so I whip myself around, and guess who I see? If you guessed the great Bye Slayer, <laughs> you'd be right. If you guessed Uncle Baguette, you'd also be right. I told X about my meeting with Brunette, and he decided, in his infinite wisdom, to come along and try to reason with me. I look back at the date. She's excited. We had already established that she's a drama chick, and this was already better than anything that you could imagine in a soap opera. X comes over, and the conversation goes something like this. So, X, me, Brunette... Uncle Baggett. Those are the four involved. Hey, can we talk, says my ex. Hey, I don't think we have anything to talk about. Oh, we need to talk about us. Um, there's no us. You broke up with me. That's when the brunette chirps in. Well, technically his mother did, hee <laughs> hee. Yeah, but oh, I'm not controlled by my mother. I should have have a say about our relationship. Our relationship's over. Your say became irrelevant when you let your mother attempt to smash my door in. That's when Uncle chimes in with an angry tone. She was only trying to protect him from you stealing his stuff. Ah, QI roll from me and Brunette. Look, baby, we both made mistakes. Can't we just go somewhere and talk about this together? No, says Brunette. You can't. She's moved on, and if you don't mind, you're disturbing our date. Well, at this point, X looked like he'd just been slapped. 
The uncle looked like he wanted to slap me, and I was just done. That's when my ex asked, oh, This is a date? I thought you were just hanging out. So Burnett replies for me, Well, yeah, turns out your magical stick fell to knock the gay out of me, so we figured why not. Thanks for giving me such a glowing recommendation, by the way. I kid you not. She said in the most smuggest voice possible while I tried not to choke on my marshmallows. Not a euphemism. X stammered, stuffered, and just kind of blinked a lot. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. So the uncle at this point raging like it was a cartoon steam would be coming out of his ears. But being the smart little breadstick he is, he kept quiet and threw us a look that Sheldon Cooper would have been envious of. Honestly, I kind of feel bad for poor X. He's got a lunatic for a mother and a stick man for an uncle, and really no clue what the real world's like. He's just kind of exist in his sock iron bubble. At this point, I knew it was time to go before things escalate. My darling drama digging date had provoked Uncle Chopstick enough, and I just had no more time for these people. I stand up, politely said excuse me to Uncle Dearest, despite his clearly fury. Properly trained British people tend to break out in hives if they aren't a little polite. I once had a meltdown because the random driver must think I'm so atrociously rude for not waving back to him after he let me pass. Honestly, it haunts me to this day. Anyways, we leave and decide to go get fish and chips from the beachfront and have a lemon-topped Mr. Whippy. It was at that point we were about to drive home when, well, my phone exploded. Not literally, of course, that'd be terrifying, but the warrior beast had awoken by her precious boy's despair. Dun dun dun. It was basically the same as yesterday's names, you know, I'm not gonna go into them, more name calling. Some lovely, I'm going to destroy your worthless lives were thrown in there, and I'm going to burn your house down. She's on ankle monitors because of me. I've ruined her precious little diddum's life. He's a broken shell of a man. I'm an evil harpy from hell. And, well, the worst one that she could say? I hope the cancer kills me. This is literally goes on just for two hours, and I switch my phone to silent and mostly ignore them. Though we do check ever so often to see if they're still coming. Then she said the one thing that really made me see red. She said she hopes my nephew dies. I saw blood. If Brunette hadn't been with me, I think I'd gone to her house and made necklaces out of her teeth. After some soothing words from Brunette, I called the lovely boy in blue that I'd spoken to the previous day, explained what was going on, and decided, despite the overall exhaustion I'm likely going to feel, I'm pressing charges for harassment. And I think he called it malicious communication. Who knows? I'm sure I'll find out soon. He came by once we were back at my place, went through my phone, diddled with some stuff, and said I'd have to come to the station on Monday to do other stuff I'm not quite clear on. Honestly, while all this was going on, it felt like angry lioness was prowling around inside me ready to drop on the neck of the next thing that approached. Same feeling I got when my nephew came home from school crying because a boy in his class threw away his crystal, and now he couldn't find it. I was legit ready to throw down with a four-year-old. Instead, I bought my nephew 16 new crystal necklaces. My recently departed Nana told him crystals heal, so he's become obsessed with having one on him at all times. He keeps that thing on him. I think it's a grief response. He'll sit there and talk to her ashes while holding his crystal. It's cute, but also <laughs> a little creepy. He's been teaching her how to play the PlayStation recently, and I think we need to get him a therapist. Or a dog. You'd think it's over. All of it, right? Well, she's got the police after her. X knows I'm over it. What is more there to be done? Darling, we forgot about the walking beanpole. What's the best way to get back at someone your family's currently harassing for calling the police? Oh, slash their tires, of course. Well, those reading Creepy Lunger will remember my nifty dash cam. It's motion activated. Now he's been arrested too. Emotionally weird mommy has been arrested. 
X tried to message me again this morning, which quite cruelly I replied with, Oh, go crawl back to your mommy. Leave me the hell alone. Before promptly blocking him and all is right in the world. As for me and Brunette, you might ask? <laughs> I'm not sure. It depends on how much drama her soul needs to survive. If she's someone that creates it to fulfill their own daily drama doses, she'll be gone. Out of here. But for now, she's currently in the living room cuddling with my cat. I'll let you know if things go once our first date ends. Next update, 11 days later. Okay, before I get into this, trigger warning. Well, you said it wasn't over and boy, you were right. Here's the warning. Horses were killed in the making of this update. I'm going to try and keep it as upbeat as possible, but I've got to warn you. Uncle's update gets dark. I'm leaving him until the very end, so if you're a horse person, maybe stop before, well, yeah. Where we last left off. My tires were slashed by Uncle Groot. Mumsy was arrested for multiple things, mostly just being a lunatic with emotional issues. Oh, and assault. An ex had been told to, quote, go crawl back to his mommy and leave me the hell alone. So what more could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Well, here's a catch-up on what happened in the last 11 days. We shall start with Mama, since it's the shortest. Mama went to the big house, decided it wasn't for her, and tried to check out by purchasing something I'm not too privy to and ODing. Either that, or she thought, quote, When in Rome, do drugs. Someone's carried up their butt. And let me tell ya, it was not proper drugs. She's currently in the hospital. I do not have a massive amount of details on what's what or what will happen next when she's discharged, as the police have mentioned psychiatric evaluation, which is desperately needed, and I agree. Despite everything, I wish her well and hope she gets the help she desperately needs, or the attention she craves, whatever it is. Do I believe it was a genuine suicide attempt? Well... Not personally, but I was also raised by a narcissist, so I'm always skeptical about narcissistic attempts on their life. Regardless, I hope she gets help. How do I know about Mama's OD, you might ask? Well, Wonder Kid showed up on my doorstep on Saturday, drunk as a skunk. Ended up spending the night in my spare room. He was completely blotted. He went through the entire drunk scale. One might say he was angry. Then he was telling me how much he still loved me. Then he was suggesting a threesome with Bree. And I then, he passed out on the spare bed. Brunette and I rolled him over and put a Kylie sheet under him to keep the mattress protected in case an accident bladder release and left him be. Sunday morning comes and he was not alright. The events of Uncle Butthead happened the day after Mama's OD, so X was pretty overwhelmed. Look, X is like a chick that's fallen from his nest. He doesn't know how to fly yet, doesn't know how to feed himself, and without someone to look after him, he'd probably be eaten by a cat. I feel for him, I really do. He's just kinda got caught in his mother and uncle's bat crap craziness. He has made mistakes, for sure, and so have I. He's so innocent, I shouldn't have gone there with him to be honest, we were never compatible, but I was grieving and he was nice. He's got no choice not to be a mama's boy now and is spinning out of control. We found him a counselor online because our university services have a long waiting list. He honestly truly believed his mother would sort everything for her precious baby boy. He honestly thought uncle would do what he did. He cried a lot and B and I did our best to console him, but his life has been more or less torn apart by all this. He's thinking of transferring his credits down south so he can live with his sister. She's a genuinely mature adult who's in North Carolina with Mama for a reason. She'd be good for him, but that's his journey. I wish him well and believe me, sober. The amusement that his ex and his one night stand were together had him laughing despite the madness. I think he's now had some time away from the devil on his shoulder. He's starting to see some sense. I can only hope the best from here on out. So, Brunette and I. Well, we're together. <laughs> She's crazy, I'm crazy, we both have terrible taste in men, it just works. It's still only like two or three weeks in, but it's nice and relaxing. 
She's not as dramatic seeking as I'd feared. She enjoys drama as much as I do, but she's pretty level-headed and kind. We shall see. I'm not holding out for a happily ever after, but she makes me feel sexy again, which is a feat, as anyone going through cancer treatment will tell you. For now, she's what I need and my cats like her. I've not introduced her to my nephew, though. I'm sure many people will be happy to hear nephews in therapy and would be doing fine right now if he didn't have the chicken pox. Poor baby looks like he's lost a fight with a beehive. Thankfully, all us adults have them as kids and are safely unaffected, though I start to itch every time I look at him. Alright guys, here's the final update, and sadness warning ahead is the uncle's update part. Uncle Brain Damage was charged and released. He made a deal to pay me back for the tires in full and took it because I'm broke. A university student and I need money. It would have taken way too long to get the money back going through courts, so it just seemed easier. He's now in custody, so let's get on with that part of the story. I have older brothers, they're basically useless lumps of men who ride horses and play PlayStation. It's gotten to the point where if they aren't attached to a remote or a horse, I don't recognize them. They be small because they're jockeys. Fun fact about jockeys. They're freakishly strong for such tiny humans. So, Uncle Whippet decides that if he can't take his beef up with me, he's going to take it up with my brothers. Because he's clearly a mature gentleman, not on a high school student dropout. Did I mention that this tall glass of water, old water, is in his 40s? But being the coward he is, he's not going to confront two small, freakishly strong gamers. Oh no. The Great Intelligence decides that whilst my brothers were riding out with a bunch of other riders coming back from the gallops, to drive up behind them and start blaring his horn. Now, for those who don't know this basic information, you do not do that. Horses get startled very easily, buck, kick, and generally run for dear life when scared. If you do this from the front, maybe since they can see you, they'd be scattery but controllable, or they'd be freaked out. These weren't yearlings, so they're used to being on the road. But coming up from behind and basically scaring the hell out of them is a big no-no. A sad, sad fact about horses, broken legs are extremely hard to heal. You have to suspend a horse for weeks in a stable and basically stop them from doing anything they do. It's difficult, time-consuming, and, well, expensive. That's if surgery's even able to realign the bone. For professional horse racers, most of the time, it's just not viable to keep them alive after a break. Well, this was the case for one of the horses startled in the process of this disgusting moron's revenge. He ran, sunk into a ditch on one side, went down, and, well, it was over. The local vet came and put him down on the side of the road. From the little I got from my very devastated brothers, the bone was showing and moving him would have been torture. I have not asked for any more details. I do know that had the police not gotten to this useless bag of bones, he'd probably have been compost. I live in a very horsey community, the only thing worse than hurting a horse is hurting a child. And you better believe it's a don't think, just run and put as many miles between you and this town as possible situation if you do. By some stroke of grace, none of the riders were seriously injured. One girl dislocated her shoulder, but that was about as serious as it got. Uncle Dirtbag has been charged with a number of things, including dangerous driving, attempted murder, and animal cruelty. You don't live around here without knowing how to act around horses, you just don't. Currently, there's a wait time on that, and I'll have basically nothing to do with it. He did apparently say something about wouldn't have to come after her brothers if she wasn't such a jerk. But that's third or fourth hand, so I can't tell you. As you can imagine, I'm horrified by this entire thing and devastated for the horse. I truly regret not going for full charges, but he likely would have been out either way. So, not sure it would have made a big difference. No blowback has come to me about this. My brothers are just extremely angry that I did not tell them about everything in the first place. Who knew they could get so overprotective? The brother bears are definitely prowling now. 
And that's everything up until now. Sorry if it's not light-hearted tale of woes everyone was expecting. But even I can't make what's happened funny. It's just been one of those few weeks, and I'm mentally too exhausted to try. But alas, I doubt it's the end, so I will update if anything more occurs. And maybe if you're all extra nice, I may regale with you some stories of my own entitled narcissistic of a mother and her antics. Small highlights include the time she was caught shoplifting from charity because she needs it more. The time she took us on a holiday on her ex's card, then was shocked, a shocked little Pikachu, when he kicked her out, or the time Santa died. For now, as Porky would say, <laughs> That's all, folks. My mother-in-law is a demon. Why do I say that? Well, my husband passes away. She should be grieving like I am with my entire family, but oh no, she comes knocking on my door at all hours of the night, saying, I was supposed to be in his will, not you. She believes that I'm nothing more than a dirty cheater. Well, you know what I'm going to do about this, mother-in-law? Let me tell ya. My name's Maggie, and my husband's Dan. Well, he died of a heart attack about three months ago. I haven't even had the courtesy to grieve over his death. Why, may you ask? Because all my mother-in-law Grace is worried about is giving everything my husband owned before he died. Even though all those belongings belong to his, I don't know, uh, wife? Which is me, of course, as well as our children. I can't get it in her head that it does not belong to her. My husband and Grace always were close, but more like I'm your mother, and I own you kind of close, as she told him everything to do when it came to everything he did. He had to buy her groceries, mow her lawn, take her to the salon, tend to her garden, and do all kinds of yard work that she wanted done that was, well, <laughs> completely unnecessary. The way I saw it was, if you can't do it yourself, why must it be done? I spent the last 25 years arguing with that woman about her treating my husband like a workhorse, just for the heck of it. She replaced her husband, who died relatively young, with her eldest son, <laughs> my husband. She would call and make him do stuff for her if she could not do it herself. The kicker of this is that he would be in big trouble if he did not answer his phone immediately. She would ice him out. Get snippy with him and ask why he did not pick up the phone when she called. It didn't matter if he was on the toilet. If that man did not answer his phone when she wanted exactly when, it was such a big deal. What always bothered me was that my husband always told his mom she was the only one in the will. When he would get home, though, he would sweet talk to me and say, No, I was just telling her what she wanted to hear, babe. And that the kids and I were the ones truly in the will, and that we would get the house and the cars and everything. As well as the money that he had saved up over the years, but... That did not stop her from harassing me every day of the week with phone calls, telling me she would get the best lawyer there was and ensure that she was the one who got everything. So, she could get her son's belongings that were rightfully hers. Quite frankly, I got tired of arguing with her, so much in the fact one day, while she was trying to barge into my house to retrieve the gun, Dan's father had given him before he passed away, I stopped her dead in her tracks and told her, um, no, I don't think so. Your husband gave your son that gun on our wedding anniversary, and you will not take that over my dead body. She stopped trying to ram her way into the house, and then, with all her might, rammed me into the front door that was partially closed. She barely pushed me, and I laughed in her face. I felt bad because she would be grieving together over such a fantastic son and husband is what we should be doing, and here we were playing a game of who's going to make it past the door fast enough. I told her I could not believe she was acting the way she was, right after her son had passed away. I told her I expected a warm, loving, grieving mother who wanted to protect her children, their mother from the horrors of the death of their child. And with that, she spit in my face and said these exact words. 
some mother and wife you were. All you ever did was moan and groan about the housework and having to work two jobs. It took everything in me not to backhand her in the mouth, and I looked at her and I said, You know, I was working my butt off the whole time he was alive because we didn't have enough money to take care of the house or the kids. And so, we could afford Dan's medical bills. Did you ever lend a helping hand with anything? Did you ever babysit when Dan was sick at the hospital? No, you didn't. You sat at home and acted like everything was fine, and if Dan were here now, I would do it again just to have him with us again. His mom rolled her eyes and told me she bet I didn't really even love him. And with that statement, I slammed the door in her face. I didn't know I had caught her index finger in the door jam, and all I could hear was her scream, My finger! My finger! So, I swung the door back open and saw her cradling her finger with blood running down her hand. Well, I offered to drive her to the hospital, but she told me to go. You know what? <laughs> well, yeah. And then took off down the walkway to her car. I did not feel slightly sorry for her because I knew what was coming. And just as I was psychic, I get a phone call from a lawyer representing Grace. He told me the house, cars, and the money left in the will belonged to my mother-in-law, and I laughed so hard and told him he's crazy. I also told him that we already went through the will with my husband's lawyer, and that he had left everything to my kids and me. And the lawyer told me that Grace had found a different will in her filing cabinet that my husband had signed, which left her everything. I told him we would see about that because I was present when my husband had his last will made up and I witnessed him sign it. He told me we were just going to have to see about that in court and I told him I'd see him there and that he would have the fight of his life. Well, I slammed down the phone and panic began to set in. Did that old little jerk forge a will from my husband and try to take everything my husband left my kids and me? My son walked downstairs for breakfast, saw the sullen look on my face, and asked me if I was okay. I told him that his grandma was trying to steal everything that daddy had left for us when he died, and to my surprise, he rolled his eyes and said, Go figure. She's always been crazy. Don't worry, Mom. We'll win. I rubbed the top of his head and told him to get ready for school. I also told him I would call Dad's lawyer immediately, and he grabbed his sack lunch and skipped out the front door. I slumped down into the kitchen chair and contemplated what to do. And that's when I remembered the camera that we had set up in my husband's room. Well, it was kind of like his death bedroom. He spent most of his time in his bed in the room, hooked up to these monitors and fluids, his heart was so weak he just could not get up and move around, and when we reviewed his will the last time, his Aunt Teal and Cousin Amber were both present, and myself. The entire moment was caught on that camera. I never understood why he wanted a camera in his room recording while he was just... perishing. And I have no idea that a camera would be the one thing that helped us win this fight. I hurried up. I grabbed the phone off the hook and called Aunt Teal. It felt like the phone was going to ring forever. And her son Jason finally picked up and said, Hey bud, is your mom home? And all I could hear was him pull the phone away from his mouth and yell, Ma, phone. And then he talked back into the phone and told me that she would be on in just a minute. So I thanked him and I waited. Hello, this is Teal. As soon as she answered, my heart began to race. Oh, hey, um, this is Maggie. I said, knowing she would be wondering why on earth I was calling her, but she kindly asked me why I was calling. Well, do you remember that day in my husband Dan's room when you, your daughter, Amber, and I were in there while Dan was going over his new will? Oh yeah, of course I remember. He was making sure the kids and you were the only ones on the will, and he wanted to do it in front of his camera, and I was relieved. When I saw that. Thank God I sighed with the relief. Why? What's wrong? 
I tried to start talking, but I was talking so fast that it all got jumbled together, so Teal told me to slow down, start over. And I explained to her that Dan's mom was trying to say that Dan left everything to her in the will, and that she even found a will that Dan had signed at her house in one of her filing cabinets. Teal was shocked. Oh, no. Well, you have video proof right before he passed away of him writing the will, honey. And wait, didn't we even hold the will up to the camera so it would show who was on the will in case something like this ever happened? I almost fell over backwards and yelled, yeah, that's right, because we were worried his mother would try to pull a stunt like this. Because Dan always told her he would leave everything in the will to her just to shut her up. Because she was impossible to deal with. She thought everything of his belonged to her. That man could not even rest in peace when he was sick because she would always be having him do work. Teal agreed with me, and then she told me not to worry. We would figure this all out together. I thanked her and hung up the phone, and that's when the doorbell rang. After my encounter with Grace, I did not even want to answer the door. But I did, and guess who it was? Yeah, you guessed it, Grace. I opened the door, and I first noticed her bandaged finger, and she was standing there with her hand on her hip. And... I asked her what she wanted, and she said that there was a glass figurine that belonged to her in Dan's bedroom that she wanted to retrieve. Uh, a glass figurine, huh? And she rolled her eyes and said, yeah, a glass figurine. I gave it to him when he got sick about five months ago. Can I go and get it? I paused, thought about it, and then it hit me. I could not allow her to go anywhere near that room because the camera with the tape and that video of the will signing was still in it. For all I know, she would go in there and steal it, so I asked her, what does it look like, and she starts to get nervous. She finally freaked out and said, well, well, I can't remember what it looks like, girl. Uh, I'll just know it when I see it. I cocked my head to the side, looked her up and down, and said, okay, I'll let you go up there, but I'll be up there with you the whole time because I don't trust you, Grace. You already tried to weasel your way into my husband's will that you know darn well he left to the kids and me. And she looked down with this evil smile and said, Oh, that, well, I have to get what's rightfully mine now, don't I? You would do the same, you mean, <laughs> your marriage was a joke. So why should you get anything? I bit my lip and then I told her if she thought she would get a dime or even a piece of furniture of his, she's absolutely crazy. And I told her that I had a little trick up my sleeve that specifically showcases my husband signing his will with lots of witnesses and leaves everything to my kids and me. And with that, I slammed the door. What's up, everybody? Mr. Redito here. Man, Grace is a nightmare. Let's just go ahead and jump into the first update. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. Here it is. I wasn't sure if I should write an update about this, but things have escalated between Grace and me. She's been harassing me every single day. She comes to my work and makes a scene, and she'll literally come into my office and yell obscenities at me and point at me when customers come into the store and tell them that I'm stealing the things her son left for her in the will. And then... When they would tell her that they were sorry, they would walk past me, giving me these dirty looks. Grace would lean towards me and just say, This whole town will know what kind of disgraceful woman you really are. Do you really think you can outsmart me? I finally had to call security and have them come escort her out the building, but it never made a difference. She even started showing up at my son's school. She would tell them that she was his grandma and that she was there to pick him up for a doctor's appointment. Well, the good thing is that my son knew better than to leave her because he knows all too well about her antics, but he was terrified because even after he explained the situation to the school, they tried to get him to leave with her anyways. And why, you ask? Grace had a note telling the school she would pick him up with my forged signature. I had to go to my son's school and tell the principal that that woman would never be allowed to pick up my children, ever. And not only that, but 
No one except me could pick them up for any reason unless I came to the school and instructed them to do so. They knew I was not too happy by the anger in my voice and probably the look on my face. I was furious that Grace would try to pick up my child from school. And only God knows what she even had planned. She just can't be trusted. So, I made a little trip over to her house to have a little chit-chat. I sped down Main Street and parked directly in her driveway, which I knew would drive her crazy, and I stomped my way up to her door. But before I could even knock, she already opened up a door and, well, she was sharpening a knife. To what do I do the pleasure? What the heck did you show up to my son's school for? Oh, I was only going to take him to his father's grave to place flowers on it. When was the last time you went up there? Hmm. Her answer caught me off guard and I did not know how to respond. I thought about it, and I told her we went up there just about a month ago. She says, Yes, and the flowers on the grave have all wilted and died just like you will one day. Maybe even sooner, if you don't give me what's mine. My mouth dropped. Oh, it was instinctful, so I hurried up and shut it. What this terrible woman did not know is that I had my phone on voice record in my pocket. Therefore, it was recording our entire conversation. Hey, I have to have as much evidence that this woman was out to get me as I could, and she was not making it very hard to get. Then she said something that I was not expecting. You do realize I know the boy is not Dan's child, don't you? She said as she sharpened the knife while gazing at the blade. What? How could she possibly know that? No one, including Dan, knew about the affair. All I could think to say was, that's not true, and what the heck would tell you such a thing? She laughed and told me she didn't need someone to tell her anything. When my son was conceived, she saw me leave my home with a nicely dressed man in a Buick Regal at 12 a.m. Shocked and furious, I turned on my heels, got into my car, and left. Update Number two. After finding out the news that Grave knew about my son not being Dan's, I was truly at a loss. But I decided to go over to Teal's house to tell someone about my affair for the first time in 13 years. I slowly drove over to her house, not ready to reveal the secret I thought I would take to my grave. But I needed to help fight against Grace if I was going to win in court. I pulled up at her apartment and put my head on my steering wheel. I was unprepared for this conversation, however, I needed someone on my side to help me devise a plan for revenge, to get Grace back for all that she's caused my family and me. I got out of the car, walked up to her front door, and I made sure to come at a time when our kids were in school so no little ears would be hearing to eavesdrop and hear about my downfall. I rang the doorbell, and Teal and her vivacious self opened the door, as if she had skipped the whole way. Her smile could have lit up the entire universe if it had gone black. However, as soon as she saw the look on my face, her smile seemed to disappear, and she said, Oh, Maggie, what's the matter? Here, come in, come in. So I reluctantly walked in, and she gestured me towards her love seat while she sat down in her recliner. All I could manage to say was that something terrible had come up with Grace. And Teal said, Oh no! Now what has she done? I looked at her with tears in my eyes and I explained how she tried to pick up my son from school and then how I confronted her about it and how she knew the one secret I've kept from Dan all these years. Well, Teal looked like she was about to cry and asked, can I trust you with this secret, Teal? To never speak a word about it to anyone, even though it'll probably come up in court? Please, Teal. Oh, I need your help to keep the belongings my husband left for my family and me. And Teal wiped her eyes furiously, straightened her posture, and said, Yes, of course, you can trust me with anything. I know how awful Grace has been to you and even to her own sons. I will help as much as possible, I promise. And after she said that, I spilled the beans on, well, everything. 
How I was overwhelmed with work, the kids, dance, health, problem, everything, and how I just started using social media on some man. Well, not just some man, but a very good-looking man who showed so much interest in me messaged me. And we talked every day, and we decided to meet up one night. And one thing led to the other, and well, you know, we got intimate, and it was around that time Zack, my eldest son, was conceived. I told her I never talked to that man again because the guilt ate me alive. I hated what I've done, and the fact that Zack could not be damned broke my heart, and with his health failing, I didn't think he could have handled the truth. Therefore, I never told him. And believe me, I regret it to this day, but I guess Grace was outside of my house that night that the man picked me up. Even strangers have pointed out how Zack doesn't look anything like the rest of us. But, Dan never suspected a thing. And I think Grace was going to tell Zack about the affair that day she tried to pick him up from school, and I don't know why. Or how it could possibly help with her court case, but Teal, I need you to testify against Grace about Dan signing the will right in front of you. He wrote that will one day before he passed away, you know. So whatever will Grace thinks that she has is void, because I had a lawyer make the will official. Teal agreed to help me testify, and we spent the next hour going over what we would say in court. Updates Number 3 After I left Teal, that day we scheduled a meeting at my house, yesterday, to go over the plan to take down Grace. But Grace was not done harassing me. She went as far as to tell my youngest son, Abel, that it was my fault his dad died. My son was distraught, and I could barely console him. The bad thing is, I don't even know how she was able to talk to him. I don't know if she stopped him on his walk home from school, or if she called him on the phone when I was out in the garden. I just don't know. But it took a lot of convincing to get him to believe that I was not the cause of his father's death. I had to break out all his medical records and explain all the conditions right there to him. I even gave Dan, providing physician, a call, and had him explain Dan's death to him. I'm going to have to send him a thank you basket for doing that, I know it, but... Anyways. Teal came over, and we sat down, and I gathered the videotape, the will, and the voice recordings that I had of Grace threatening to kill me, if she didn't get what she wanted from what my husband had left us when he passed. I put the videotape in the VHS player, and watched through it. It was so hard to watch him as he lay in the bed withering away, I started bawling my eyes out, and Till told me to go in the other room. She would find the spot on the tape where we were all standing around watching him write out the will. Therefore, I stepped into the kitchen and waited. Found it! Till yelled from the other room. So I hurried and ran into the living room and watched it with her, and it showed everything perfectly. All of us surrounding him, witnessing him write out everything that went on to each person, and we zoomed in right there on the signing of the will. So, no one could say he was just writing on a piece of paper, and I could have sworn I've taken it to the lawyer to have him make it official, but to my wonderful surprise, he was standing right there in the doorway in the video. And once Dan was done writing and signing his name, the lawyer came over and made the document official. That evidence was enough to completely destroy her in court. And then I had a great idea. Well, Teal. Do you think your daughter Amber would also testify in court about the will since she was in the room when it was signed? And Till thought about it for a second and said, Well, she's away at college about an hour away, but I will give her a call right now. I thanked her profusely, and then I got onto my laptop and got set up for my smartphone was linked to it, and then I downloaded the voice recording of Grace threatening me about the will. I downloaded it to a USB drive. That way, I could easily give it to the judge to have him place it in a computer in the courtroom to play it for everyone to hear. But then my heart sank. What if Grace says that's not her voice on the recording? So, I come up with a plan to tell Grace and tell her I would bring over the figurine that she tried to receive from my house that one day. And I would have my little pinpoint camera placed on my jacket so I could videotape her talking. That way, if she does deny being the one talking on the recording, I'll have the video of her talking as well, which will sound exactly the same. She won't be able to get out of it. Well, once Teal was off the phone, I told her my plan, and she thought it was absolutely brilliant. 
She told me that Amber would be willing to testify, and I hugged her and told her I had to go to Grace's house now. So, I asked her to lock up on her way out, and I grabbed the ugly little figurine, which I'll be honest with you, my husband hated. He said it freaked him out, but anyways. I drove over to Grace's house, pinpoint camera in place of my jacket, and I rang that doorbell. She came to the door and said, Have you figured out if your house, cars, and money are worth your life yet? She laughed while throwing her head back, and I just handed her the figurine and said, I'll see you in court. Hope you're ready to lose because you have one heck of a fight on your hands, and you don't even know what you're about to walk into. I turned around and got into my car and sped off. Update number four. Hey guys, it's been a week since the court date, and I could not wait to get on here and tell you guys about it. I'm sorry that this update's taken so long to come out, but so much has happened. Well, let's begin in the courtroom. Everyone that was supposed to testify showed up, thank God, and little old Grace was all by her lonesome on the other side of the aisle, just her lawyer and herself. The judge let Grace's lawyer go first, and literally all he had for a case was that... Miss Grace found a will her son had drawn up in a filing cabinet with a date that read March 23rd, 2002. He tried to tell the judge that was the most recent will that he made. Then it was my lawyer's turn. He said, Your Honor, this woman who sits across the aisle is narcissistic, greedy, and an old woman. I have a videotape of the defendant's husband, Dan, right there on his deathbed one day before he passes. As you'll see the timestamp of the video, sir, of him writing out his last will. He had four witnesses in that room that day when he signed it, and would you like to take a look at it? And the judge told him to go ahead, show it to us. So he did. And he saw everything my husband wrote in the will, specifically leaving everything to my kids and myself. And the close-up of him signing it, and the judge turned away from the monitor and told Grace's lawyer, Well... That right there is enough for me to judge in their favor. And then my lawyer said, But wait, Judge, there's more. There's a video recording, voice recording, and two witnesses to justify. And the judge said, Very well, let's hear from the witnesses. So, Teal testified about Amber testifying that Dan wrote out the will specifically to give it to his wife and children. And nowhere on the will was Grace ever mentioned. Afterward, the judge heard the voice recording of Grace threatening me if I did not just give her the stuff that was rightfully hers in the will. And then the icing on the cake. The video recording of me giving Grace back her figurine, and the judge witnessed her ask me if my house, cars, and money were worth my life. The judge turned back away from the monitor and told Grace that she was lucky he did not send her to jail for this threat. But she would be put on probation for five years and restraining orders would be put in place immediately for my whole family to keep Grace away from us. The only reason we got the restraining order was that my lawyer mentioned the school incident and how Grace told my son that I was the reason his father died. So, that day, we won. I got to keep my home, cars, and the money, which means life can go as normal as it possibly can. I sure do miss Dan, and I know he's smiling down on me right now because he never did get along with his mother. And if he knew that she put us through this whole time, it's hard telling what he would have done to stop it. Teal and Amber both have become like sisters to me. We meet up every Monday and have lunch, and I even gave them both $10,000 from the money of the will for helping me defeat Grace. Of course, neither of them wanted to take it, but I placed the money in a trust fund. So, they get payments every month whether they like it or not. My kids and I are living perfect lives now. It's not the same without their daddy, but it's definitely better without their narcissistic grandmother coming around every day. The story's moral is that greed is a sin, and it'll cause you to do some crazy stuff. Just... Hope and pray that you never try to hurt others just for a bit of cash. If you're meant to have it, ah, I guess you will. So this story had so many avenues. It was crazy, full of drama, everything you can imagine. But I'm caught up in the comment section on this one because, well, it seemed like every single person 
was on OP's side through the first few updates, but the second OP releases the news that, well, she cheated, and the son is not who we thought it was. It seemed like everybody changed. Everyone in the comment section was saying, see, the mother-in-law really isn't that evil. She must have been onto something. She knew the true intentions of OP, and were simply not getting the full side of the story, and neither did the judge. Well, I want to know from you guys, because this story was so deep. What would you do if you were OP, and your secret gets aired to the world, and you have to come clean? I want to know also what you would do if you were on the mother-in-law side and you just think, my son passed away, and now this dirty cheater is getting all of his stuff, and I'm just left out to dry. So yeah, there's really sticky situation on both sides. Let me know where you fall. Whose side do we take on this one? Help me out, guys. Let's discuss it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. My name's Mr. Redito. If you're new to the channel, I release a story every single day. Hit that subscribe button for more daily videos, and remember... It's cool to be kind. See ya!